Okay, so today we're going to start with a brief review of microcontrollers. We'll talk a little bit about the block lead pro programming that we introduced last time. And then we'll go on to the lecture. So for the lecture today, we're going to talk a little bit about 3D printing. We'll talk about what that is. And we also have a 3D printer that is in our lab now. So we'll be able to use that for the next several weeks. And so we will actually start printing the name tags today. So we're just going to go through in alphabetical order. We should be able to print maybe three or four at a time. So the first three or four people will get to print their name tags today. And then we'll go on and do the, uh, the next ones in the next classes after that. We'll talk a little bit more about programming as well. So we'll go into some more advanced concepts like functions and we'll show how we can actually create several different functions to do different things. Okay? So any questions before we get started? Okay. <clears throat> so let's start with a brief review of microcontrollers. We said that microcontrollers were little computers that had all the components that they needed on one board. So they have the same components as a regular computer, such as a, a processor, memory, um, sometimes they have input-output devices as well. But whereas a, a regular controller or a regular computer might have all of those different pieces on different boards, a microcontroller has all of those pieces built in together on one single board. Okay. So we talked about a couple of examples of microcontrollers. We talked about the one that we're going to be using, which is the, the activity board from Parallax. That uses a propeller microprocessor. And we talked about that one. There were many other examples as well. So we talked about a Raspberry Pi. And Errol was kind enough to bring in his Raspberry Pi Zero, which is the same thing but the smaller form factor and even less expensive. Um, we talked about Arduinos. Those are another popular type of microcontroller. We looked at basic stamps, which we have used in ET302. So these are all different examples of microcontrollers. Each one has its own advantages and disadvantages. Oh, Michael brought in uh, another one. So this is yet another Microcontroller. Do you mind if I pass this around? Yeah, oh my. Okay. So it's called a microchip ticket three. There you go. So all of these that. microcontrollers have their own advantages and disadvantages. Some of them, like the the Raspberry Pi, run an operating system like Linux. So that okay. That one can do things like connect to the internet. Other microcontrollers run real time. So they can execute commands at very set intervals. And that's good for things like controlling motors and, and other things which need operations to happen at a very set, fixed interval. So each microcontroller has its own advantages and disadvantages. OK? All right. So any questions about microcontrollers? OK. So, hey, Michael, I appreciate the, the stuff, but let's talk about that afterwards. So, let's talk a little bit about block lead prop programming. We said that each microcontroller can be programmed in one or more languages. So, the one language that we're going to be using in this class is called block lead prop. The way that this language works is that instead of typing out commands on a text editor, you actually use an online editor and you drag and drop commands that are almost like blocks that fit together. So these blocks just snap one onto the next almost like Legos. So I like this because it's quick and easy to put those commands down and you don't have to worry about the syntax. You just, you know that if you drop one of those commands, it's going to be written correctly. You won't misspell anything or anything like that. So that's the editor that we're going to be using. We used it last time to do some th simple things like turning on and turning off lights. Um, yeah? What was the name of the website to get for the block? block, block? So 
The editor is at Blockly.parallax.com. So I have made sure that we have the correct version of the program installed on our computers now. So today, you guys will be able to log in to this website. You'll have to create your own account, and then you can log in, and then we can use this website to program the microcontrollers that we have. So you guys will be starting on that today. Oh, Blockweeds is brand new from Parallax. Yeah, this is a fairly new language in the last year or so that they, they have come up with. The language Blockly is actually, was invented by Google, yeah. and it was, an, it was an open source language, and it, was adopted by a number of different companies. So Google so uses it to write propellers. games. I'm sorry, did you have a question? Yeah, so that works with all propellers? So if I, I yes. use I, I, I a different programming type, all that stuff is, so blocking can work with, with all, every propeller. So the propeller is a microchip that's made by Parallax. And yeah. yes, Blockly no, prop language will work with any of their computer any of the boards that include a propeller. So, like I said, the Blockly language was invented by Google. It was adopted by a number of companies. There's a, a company through MIT that actually uses Blockly to make apps for a cell phone. So if you figure out how to write Blockly code for the microcontroller, you can take those skills and write apps for your phone. It's pretty cool. Um, and you can also use it to make simple computer games and things like that. So this is a language that's really catching on. It's, it's a fairly new language, but it's really taking off, I think. So any questions about Blockly Prop or programming? Uh, yeah, that's an interesting improvement. Yeah. I looked it up. You could actually look Blockly on your iPhone or, uh, or Android. Yep, yep, you can do that. So we talked about a couple of commands that we used for Blockly last time. We said there was a command that was set pin one high, for example. So if we had a voltage probe connected to pin one, we would see that when we use that command, we get a high voltage or about a five volt signal coming out of that pin. We saw that there were actually two LEDs that were already built in to the propeller board that we were using. They were connected to pins 26 and 27. So if we put a high voltage on pin 26 or pin 27, it made those lights light up automatically. Okay. So a command that said low 26 would turn the light off that was connected to pin 26. And then finally, we looked at a pause command. So the pause command just tells the processor to wait a certain amount of time. So any questions about those commands? Okay, then let's go on to today's lecture. So today we're going to start by talking a little bit about 3D printing. And then we'll go on and do a little bit more programming and talk a little bit more about some more advanced functions. We'll do some programming today. We're going to learn about how to actually make functions that you can call. So we're going to make a function that is called turn left, which causes your robot to turn left. Then we'll make a function which is called turn right, and a function which is called go straight. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, um, so the reason that we're gonna be building these functions is that they will make the foundation for our navigation program. So over the next several classes, we're gonna be building up bits and pieces of the navigation program so that in about three classes, we will have all of the program written. So you guys will understand exactly how your navigation program was put together. And then that'll be the basis of the program that you're gonna use for the midterm. You guys can tweak it around and modify it. Remember, it's a challenge to see who can get around the track the fastest. So I'll give you kind of a foundation program and then you can tweak it and, and improve it and try and get your robot to go faster, okay? 
So we're going to be learning about functions today, and then we're going to learn how to use them next time. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about 3D printing. So 3D printing is just what it sounds like. It's the process of taking a three-dimensional design, like the one that you guys created in Inventor, and turning that design into a physical piece of hardware, something that you can actually see and, and touch and pick up and play around with in the real world. Who here has done 3D printing before? A couple of people. Who here has heard of 3D printing? Almost everybody. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, so make a go to 3D printer. Well, some, some people um, use, 3D printing as a tool, so just like any tool it can be used for good purposes or bad purposes, um, it would be, yeah, so we're not going to do anything like that. We're not going to ever make any kind of weapon in this <laughs> class. So it's, it's not a joke, it's not anything to mess around with. That's a, a very serious thing. We're, we're not going to play around with that. We're not even going to touch that. So what we're going to do is we're going to learn a little bit about how 3D printing works. So basically, what happens is that you start with a... You, you have a bed that can move around back and forth in sort of the horizontal plane, and then you have a printing head that comes and deposits material onto the bed. So this is basically like a glorified hot glue gun, okay? You have, you have plastic material over here in a long filament that gets fed down into the print head. The end of the print head gets heated up to a temperature that's high enough to melt this filament. And then there is a little gear here, a little wheel, two wheels really, that turn and push this material down into the head. So. What happens is that you put your design into the computer. The computer figures out how to cut it into lots of little, tiny, very thin layers. And then this printer actually prints out one layer at a time. So it uses this material to create a very thin layer of plastic on top of the print bed in the shape of the part that you've designed. And then, after it creates the first layer, it moves the head up just a tiny fraction of an inch, and then it puts down the second layer. And then it goes up another fraction of an inch and puts down the third layer, and so on. So it puts down layer after layer after layer, making more and more thickness to your part until you get to the very top. Okay? So that's the general idea about how 3D printing works. Now, this means that Certain shapes are very well suited to 3D printing, and other shapes don't work very well. For instance, if you wanted to create a model of the Empire State Building, that would be pretty good. It goes kind of like this, and all of the yeah. So so all of you, you'll notice that the base of this part is the the widest part, right? And then it gets narrower and narrower as it goes up. So this type of part is good. It's easy to 3D print because the bottom layers are the widest. And so they support everything that sits on top. <coughs> Other designs, like mushrooms, are very difficult to print. If you, if you tried to print a mushroom, what would happen is that you would, you would print these first couple layers, and they'd be fine. But then when you got up here, your printer would suddenly try and create a layer out here that's just not supported by anything. It would be hanging out over the air. So it would 
it would probably just fall down and, and wouldn't stay up. So yeah, that's a bad motion board. I'm not a I'm not an artist, <laughs> so I apologize. But it's a tree. Yeah, sure, it's a tree. So the the point is that if you have a mushroom or a tree with with material that is just hanging out over space, it's not going to 3D print very well because it doesn't have anything to support it. Yeah. But if the top of it was flat, you could flip it over. Ah, that's that a way, right? that's a good point. So right. So sometimes it's possible to print a, a shape like this by flipping it on its head. So if you wanted to make something like this, you could possibly print it like that. Um, so you you just have to think about the way that you're. Or, or think about what you want to make and then think about how you could set it up so that the the bottom part of the print is the widest part okay so that is the the basics of how parts get created well you could also manufacture uh, supports like you can put into your model like little support teams so if you have a project like that it can or if you don't want it to stick to the bed, you build like little um, uh, lines at the bottom so you can just scrape it off. Right, so that's true. So there are advanced techniques for printing things like this. You can tell the model, okay, I know that I'm gonna have some parts sticking out. What I wanna do is build these little support structures. So that a support is just a very small, thin piece of material that is designed specifically to hold up part of your model. So it gets printed, and then after it's been printed, you, you peel the whole thing off of your printer, and then you have to cut away these supports to just leave your actual part behind. So when, so sometimes you can do that in order to support a material or a model that, that might be hanging over thin air otherwise. So that's a little bit more advanced. We're not really going to do that in this class, but that is a technique that you can use. Okay. Um, now, if you had a big piece of plastic like this, if you had a big model that you were making and you made the whole thing completely solid, it would be very heavy and it would use a lot of material. And it's probably not necessary for the material to be, or for the part to be that solid. Okay? So the, the computer is smart enough to realize that. And so what it does is that if you tell it, that you want to print a, a solid cube of material, it's going to say, aha, you, you gave me a model which is a solid cube, but I know you're probably not going to want to make that whole thing one gigantic block of plastic. So what the program does is that it actually, it will build a shell for you, but then it will not make the interior of your object completely solid. What it will do instead is that it will create a pattern in the middle which is more like, it looks more like a honeycomb, okay? So if you were looking at the top-down view of a cube that was being printed and you were looking at it about halfway through, you would see something like this. You've got sort of a honeycomb pattern in the middle. And this honeycomb pattern can be different densities. So if you want a, a really solid part, you could make this honeycomb pattern very small. And then that would make it a very tight knit pattern, and that would make a very dense part. If you wanted to have a lighter part that doesn't use as much material, then you could tell the computer that, and this honeycomb 
would be, it would use larger honeycombs and so it would be less dense. So you can specify the density of your part. So you can choose whether you want it to be really thick and heavy and, and strong or lighter weight, not quite as strong, but using less material, okay? So, so let's go through the actual process of sending a part over and having it printed. So I'll, I'll show you the steps that you go through. And we can talk a little bit more about each one of them as we go along. Okay. do when you send a piece over to your um, to your or the first step that you're going to do in order to send a part to the printer is that you're going to open up the part in inventor okay so so let's open this up So this will just take a minute. So every program has their own version. So the, the software that runs the printer can't read all those different versions of 3D parts. Instead, that software can only read one version. So basically, all of these different 3D CAD programs need to be able to create a common form of part. So that one common form is called an STL file. So what you have to do is that in order to send the part to the 3D printer, you have to export that part as an STL file. So I will... Um, what does STL stand for? I don't know what it stands for. S. Where do you understand it? You know like where it actually came from. Yeah. I'm not sure what it stands for. So it does, uh, like, what uh, program actually uses SPL? Well, the program that runs the computer is called Repetier Host. Oh, uh, so Repetier Host. Repetier Host. So that is. So that is. Professor, is that S as in Sam or X as in X ray? STL? Sam. Yeah. Oh, STL. Yeah, Sierra Tango. So, so the way that we do this is that I'll show you in a second. Okay. So what we do is we go to file and then export, and we'll choose a CAD format.
and then it's going to ask you where you want to save it. You can save it anywhere you want. I'm going to put it on the desktop for now. So you're saving it as a CAD file first? So, so you, you go export as a CAD file, and then it has a whole list oh. of different CAD files that you can choose from. So the one that you want is the STL file at the very bottom. Does it say next to it, STL files dot STL? Yeah, start dot STL. So export. we're going to save that. And that turns our inventor file into this generic STL format. So that's the first step. Once you have your file in a generic file format, then you have to actually create the layers that you're going to print. Okay? So that's the second step. That step is called slicing your your file. Because Essentially, you take this three-dimensional object and you slice it into these very thin layers. This is where you get to specify all of the parameters that really determine whether you have a nice print or not. So in this step, you get to specify the density of your part. You get to specify the thickness of the walls of your part. You get to specify how thick or how thin you want the layers to be. So if you have thick layers, the part will print more quickly because you, you need fewer layers to do it, but the edges will be rougher. The, the surfaces won't be quite as smooth. If you have thin layers, it'll be smoother, but it'll take longer. So you can, you can specify that. You can also specify a lot of very fine details about how this is going to print. So you can specify things like the, the way that the, or, or how much the filament gets moved back into the head between each time that you go from, from one spot on your print to the next spot. So there's just a ton of different settings that you can choose while you're slicing your part. Um, and, and those settings really determine the look and feel of the final product. So in order to, to get a really nice part, you really want to have those settings all dialed in. Now, it's a very complicated thing to learn about every single one of those settings and exactly what they do and how to tweak them and, and what setting is best for what thing. Fortunately, the good people in the design <coughs> studio have done all of this work for you. They've played around <coughs> with all of these things. They have tried out lots of experiments and they have found a set of settings that works very well. And so rather than having to change all of those things around yourselves, you can just load up the settings that they already have and you can know that they will work. So it's good to be aware that you can choose all of these things, but for the purposes of this class, we're not going to bother with tweaking with those. We're just going to use the settings that are already available and that will give us a, a good looking part. Okay? So in the future, if you wanted to go into 3D printing more and, and do more with it, you know that you would be able to play around with these things and achieve different results. But for now, all we have to do is load up the settings that they already have. Okay? So, any questions about that? Let me just check one thing here. Bye. Okay, so it's on. So, That's pretty much what I wanted to say about 3D printing. I will give you guys a little bit more information individually when it's your turn to actually <coughs> load up the, the printer or load your part onto the printer. So I'll show you how to put your parts into the, the printer, how to load them up, how to put them on different places on the bed, how to flip them around, things like that. Um, so you guys will learn a little bit more about that one-on-one, -on -one, but for now, I think that's, that's enough to get you started.
So yeah. you can actually uh, do a mushroom on a 3D curve, but you have to do it upside down. Right, we talked about that. Yeah, yeah. So let's go on and talk a little bit more about programming. Okay. Is that organic or is that sugars and stuff? You go around and make some shrooms, man. All right. So. So we'll go to blockly.parallax.com. Okay, Hello, Gary George is the department chair. <laughs> so you will have to create your own your own login for Blockly. It is entirely free. You can use the your ARC student address to do that. What your likes does it? Why don't they just give us program? Why don't they what? Give us the program. Well, it's all online, so it's not anything that you download. And really, they are not charging you anything for it. So they they are giving it away. They're just having it online. And I think the reason that they want to have it online is that they want to be able to update it without you having to do anything on your end. Also, when you create an account, you create space where they will save all of your programs for you online. And then you can access them from any computer that connects to the internet. So, so that's what's going on there. So, Let's just do a quick review of what we talked about last time. Hmm. Okay. So we talked <laughs> So when I run this, it says the blocking prompt client is not found. So what that means is that you have to run this program called the blocking prompt client. This allows the computer to connect to the activity board. Okay. So you click connect and then it will connect to the board. And then you can go back here and now this program is working. So remember last time we created a program that would turn a pin on. So we can connect pin 26 here, for example. And we can look at our board and see what happens when we run this program. <coughs> So down here at the bottom of the board, there are these two little surface mount LEDs. One is labeled pin 26 and the other is labeled pin 27. So if I run this program that's making pin 26 high, we should see that little light for LED pin 26. We should see that go on. So I click the green arrow to download the program. And it says it's not found on COM1. So we have to choose a different COM port. So let's try COM11. But there we go. Yes. And when I do that, you can see that that light goes on. OK? So we said last time that we could also have this control function where we make the program wait for a certain amount of time. Pause function. Yeah, it, it's a pause function, and then we can make the light go off. So this will make the light wait for two seconds. It'll go on, it'll wait for two seconds, and then it'll go off. So we should be able to see this run. So it goes on, and then it goes back off. Okay? And then finally, what we said was that we could make this run 
in a loop. We could make it run over and over again. So if we drag this repeat forever loop there and run this, now the light should go on and stay on and then go off and stay off and just blink on and off and on and off forever. So those were some of the commands that we used last time. And you could actually do this and make another light and alter, make them alternate. Sure, you could do that too. So you guys <coughs> will make a program just like this and run that, and then you'll turn that in, or you you will take a picture of that and turn that in to the Canvas website. Okay. How about a video? I would prefer a picture, just of the, the program. I'll you don't have to the actually show it running. Copy, paste, or so like a snippet? Yeah, a snippet or a screen capture. Yeah, yeah. So then, let's go on and talk about what we're going to do today. Okay. So today, we're going to talk a little bit about functions. So a function is a little piece of the code that you can call. And you want to be able to call this function from various parts of the code. So there's, there's several good reasons why we use functions. First of all, it makes it easier for you guys. Um, if you, because you, you only have to write the code once, and then you can reuse it over and over again. For instance, if you are making a go left function, then you can use, you can just call that function every time you want your robot to turn left. You don't have to write that function or the, that same code over and over again. You can just write the code once, and then every time you want to use it, you just tell the program, hey, use that, that function, and the program will do that. Okay? So that's one good reason. Another so reason is that you can you test it more easily. One, yes? Why can you put, like, say, uh, remarks? Comments? Yeah, like comments. Yes. Hey, how do you do that? Yeah, yeah. You, is yeah. that a separate tab? You go up here and control, you click on add comment, and then you can type in. Oh, there it is. And then you can know like, what the program is and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, comments are very important. So You don't have to put a label in there? Or you know? Nope, that's all you have to do. Oh, it's pretty easy. Yeah, so. It's easier than the original program. So, what the other, yes? Do you have to connect it? Can you just leave it in free space? It can, you, it can you just be in free space. Them? Yeah, okay. it has a battery window thing that's all safe. Yeah, so the other reason that we're going to use functions is because functions can be run on separate cores in the, uh, the propeller. So remember we said that the propeller has eight separate cores that can all do different things at the same time? Well, the way that you get your program to run on separate cores is that you can write different functions. And then you can tell a particular <coughs> function to start running on its own core. So if you wanted to have one function that was in charge of looking for other robots, for instance, you could write that function out. And then when your program starts, you could launch that function into its own core so that that function would now be running over and over again all by itself in its own core and you could have your main program free to do other things. Yeah? So you can only have up to eight functions or is it as many functions you can it just runs it until it's done and stops and so on and so forth? Right. You can have as many functions as you want. You can only have eight of them running at the same time. But like you said, you could have one function that, that runs until it's done and then ends and then you could call a different function there. And you don't have to run the functions in their own separate core. So you could have three or four functions that you call from the main program and just run that way. And then you could have other functions that are meant to run separately on their own cores. So one function could be like uh, it's moving forward, and then it, it sees another robot, and it uh, operates another function where it's like trail this other robot. Yeah. And still move forward. Yeah. But the other function would be give commands and needs to go back to the right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, or like say, look, another uh, propeller ship. Mm -hmm. See, another ACOG. 
How can I make that thing into a 16 cop? Like, say, if I were to, say, you just do is just attach, uh, in, so you just basically attach us like a separate chip? Like, so, so it is possible to communicate between different chips. It's not trivial. I'd be happy to talk to you afterwards and, and yeah, talk I about how you could do chip. that. I would try and see if I can get that happen. Yeah, well, you can you can try it out. We can talk afterwards and, and see how that might work. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about how you actually make a function. Okay. So it's actually pretty simple to do. You just go to the functions menu and then grab this block, which is called my function. Okay. So for instance, I could have a function <coughs> which I'll call link fast. Okay? And now inside of link fast, I will make some code that causes the lights to blink quicker. So um, I'll make this one high. So if I want the lights to blink quickly, am I going to have a long pause or a short pause? Short pause. So short. Very so probably like one millisecond. Or okay. Well, that would probably be too fast to see, but we'll try yeah. 100 milliseconds. 100 milliseconds. See if we can see that. And then you can copy both of those. Yes. So to copy something, you right click on it and say duplicate. And then I'll make this one low. And I'll duplicate this one as well. All right, so that will be my blink fast function. And now I can make another one, which is blink slow. So I can duplicate this whole function over oh, here. so useful. Yeah, it's, it's pretty quick. And then I'll call this one blink fast too. Well, that's the default name, but I want to make it slow. So I'll call it blink slow. And then here I'll change the delay to, yeah, one, one second. Um, well, 10 seconds, right? Because 100 is a second? Uh, no, 1,000 no, thousand thousand is a second. So, it's yeah. just a little second. And now the other thing is that I don't want this to run forever. Because if I call this function, and the function runs forever, it's, it's just going to run this function. It's, it's never going to do anything else. So I will make this run a certain number of times. So I will make this run say, 10 times. Okay, So I'll make each of them run 10 times. So these functions are great, but they don't do anything until you actually tell them to run. So the switch somewhere. Right, so what we are going to do is we're going to go back to the functions palette, and now under the functions menu, they have these two additional blocks. So I'm going to use this one called blink fast, and then I'll go back and I will grab the other one. How do you change the phase on those things? Like, like say, like if I were to look at like say a couple of LEDs, I want them to blink like but but in a different phase with each other. Like your phasing, like like where's the uh, phasing, like like uh, like say there's mic pin, high or low. I don't quite understand uh, what you mean by uh, phasing. Say if I want, I don't want them to blink at the same time. Right. So, so you could maybe run them on separate cores or something like that. So let's so let's you see how change, this uh, like the timing. Say yeah. I want this guy to blink. Say you say you uh, one hundred milliseconds. And this other guy do 100 milliseconds. But say this guy, I want this guy to blink, say, say like now. Yeah. And this guy wait a while and then start blinking. So that would so be more alternate. complicated. You could do that in mm -hmm. these functions, but it would it would be a little bit more complicated. You'd have to. Um, Isn't there ifs? Yeah, there there are. But let's run this oh, yeah. first. Yeah. 
and see what happens. So this says that it's going to call the blink fast function first, and then the blink slow function afterwards. So if we run this, we should see the light go on and off pretty quickly at first. You might not actually do that. Oh, well, let's see what happens. So, oh yeah, there, no, it's you. Yeah, so. Is that fast or slow? No, this is the slow. What, what happened is that the camera actually has a refresh rate problem. It refreshes very slowly, so the light was blinking faster than you could see. So let me, let me hold this up, and maybe you guys can see it. Can you see the little light from where you're sitting? green light? Or oh, where's the little light there? It was up here. All right, so here we go. So we're going to run first. We're going to reset that. Yeah. It's yeah. blinking fast. And then it's blinking slowly after yeah. that. Okay. Yeah, because solar alternates. Yeah. Yeah, it blinked fast first, and then it's blinking slowly. So you don't see the pause between the two functions, because otherwise it's just going flash 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 flash. And the last one sets off, and then it just starts again. So right. If right. I can put more definite difference. So, yeah, so you could put a pause in between the functions if you want. But the point is that you can write different functions and then call them this way. Makes it yeah. so much easier. Yes, question. And you could embed those functions into a, a repeat also, right? Yes, yes. So we could have another loop up here and we could put our functions inside of that loop. And now, when we run this program, we'll make this the second one and we go five times because it's so slow. Now when we run this program, yeah, it should blink fast and then blink slow and then go back to blinking fast. So it's doing, it did the fast part, it's doing the slow part now, and then in a second it'll go back and do the, the fast part again. There it is, now it's back to the fast part. So, yeah, so you can, you can call those functions however you want. So let's talk a little bit about servo motors because the servo motors are the ones that we're going to be using to drive our cars. Are you going to give us the dimensions of it too, like the holes we need and stuff? For the servos? Yeah, because I saw it on your build. Right. I'm really planning it on my build. So, I don't know when I play. So I am going to actually, so you guys are not going to print out your own chassis. If you have your own printer at home and you really feel the need to do that, you, you can. The files will be available here. I would suggest that you start from these files and then modify them, because I know that these files work. You can, uh, we'll talk later in the semester about how you can create additional pieces to attach to the chassis, but I would recommend that you just use the, the chassis that we print out here, and that'll have the dimensions for the servos and everything built in. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so let's talk a little bit about servo control. The Blockly software actually makes it really easy to control servo motors. There's this menu called servo, and they have all of these options here. We're going to be using a continuous rotation servo. So we'll just grab this block that controls continuous rotation servos. So all you have to do is specify the pin that you want to connect to. I saw a big, huge servo once at fleet market. Yeah. Yeah, I'm like trying to get it. So these servo motors can be connected to pins 12 through 17. If you look at the top of the board here, you can see that there are these headers that are made specifically for plugging in servo motors. And they're labeled 12 through 17. So you can use pins 12 through 17 to control the motors. So we'll pick pin 12, for instance, and then you can set a speed. So the speed is just a number between zero and, or it's actually between minus 200 and 200. So a speed of zero means that the servo motor is going to stop. A speed of 200 would be full speed in one direction, so full speed clockwise, for instance. 
and then any number between 0 and 200 will set the speed in the clockwise direction. So, uh, so 25 would be a slow speed, 100 would be kind of a medium speed, and then 200 would be the maximum speed. Yeah? Which time the positive is clockwise? So I can never remember which one is which. So positive is one direction, and negative is the opposite direction. But you guys will have to check and see which one is which. Okay. So a servo will only use it if you take binary data and put it in a servo register. Like binary data? So in this case, all we have to do is we just have to run this block and tell the program what speed we want the servo to run. Okay. Yeah, so it's like a program yeah, they use an angle and a speed. I think that the uh, I think on regular on, on servo like uh, to make those things work, the actual servo without the computer, I think you have to like put a binary like say ones and zeros. Well we don't have to do that here. Yeah. So Yeah, but I mean the, the basic understanding of servo. So what we're going to do here is that we're going to call this function go forward, okay? So when we make a go forward function, um, what we can do is we'll just set one servo going in one direction. And then the tricky thing is that the other servo motor is going to be on the other side of the robot. So in order for both of the wheels to roll forward, one of them has to go clockwise and the other one has to go counterclockwise. So we will simulate that here and we'll make another one. We'll say that this motor is connected to pin 13 and we'll make this one go minus one. So that can be the go forward function. Yeah. Are all the servers we're going to be using balanced? Or are we going to have to tune them to where one wheel isn't going, say if they're both at 100? And it's still going uh, side to the left or side to the right. They, like they should be balanced. Um, there, you might have to do a little bit of tweaking, but it should be pretty close. Okay. Yeah. So yes. Um, when is the speed like? What rate of speed is it? Where is it? Is it at like revolutions? Per minute? No, it's not it's just like, like 100 steps. revolutions per minute or anything. That's just um, it's just a, a relative number. So higher number is faster. Closer to zero is slow, but it doesn't have a, a specific unit. But it's like clicks in the years. Like how fast it's going forward, or does that connect to like the piece inside of it that's making it like that's moving? Um, it it connects to how quickly the motor is turning. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Doesn't that have to do with the signal being sent to the motor, like the electricity, how fast the pulse is being sent? Um, no, actually, the way that the servo motors communicate is that the pulses are always sent at 20 millisecond intervals. It's the width of the pulse that determines the, the speed of the motor. So this will be related in some way to the pulse width, but I, again, I still don't think it's a, a real specific unit to unit direct, direct, yeah, direct direction. conversion. It's just a higher number is faster and closer to zero is slower. Yeah. What was the highest number again? So it's between minus 200 and 200. But really most of the difference happens in the minus 100 to 100 range. So, so that'll be our go forward function. So if I wanted to make a go back function, I could duplicate this. What would I have to change to make this? So first of all, I'll change the name. But what would I have to change in the code in order to make this uh, go backwards? Yeah. Uh, pin 12 would have to be negative and pin 13 would have to be positive. Yeah. I literally just switch the numbers around. That's true. I could do that. So I can type in new numbers or I can grab one and then trade oh, off cool. their positions. Okay. Yeah. So you see, if I have my go forward function like this, and this is making the wheels rotate forward, then if I switch the, the signs, so, uh, that will make the wheels rotate backwards. So now we've got to go backward function. And I can do a similar thing for 
a go left function and a go right function. I'm not going to do that here. I'll let you guys figure that one out. So the, the assignment for today will be to create four different functions. Go forward, go backward, turn left, and turn right. Okay? And then you will want to save that because next time we're going to be using that. Next time we're going to make a bigger program that calls these functions and does some, some simple navigation. Yes? Do you want us to make it turn left and go or just turn, stop, or? Um, so I would say just, just turn left. Like 90 degrees or? Well, so. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're not going to part. You know, short turn. Turn. Yeah, any turn. Yeah, you, yeah, you can do things like that. Um, but I would say just turn. So it doesn't have to be for any specific length of time. Okay. Um, because what we're going to do next time is that we're going to actually, um, we're going to call these functions at, at various times. So if the robot sees that there's just a straight line ahead of it, it's going to call the go straight function. If it sees that the line is going to touch one of the one of its sensors, it'll have to call the go left. And then as soon as it yeah. it doesn't see the line anymore, it'll tell itself to go straight again. Yeah. So yeah, so it can um, so you, you don't have to specify any particular fixed interval for these. Okay. Yeah. These sensors you're talking about so sound so almost like yeah. Yeah. what's so what are the sensors? Yeah. So the, the sensors aren't too magical. We'll talk more about them a little bit later. But basically, they just detect light or darkness. So what happens is that we're going to have a dark line sitting on top of some light tiles. The white tiles. The white tiles like we have on the floor here. And then the sensors will just be looking for light or dark. So if they're over the tiles, they'll see a light. Um, surface, they'll get a lot of light reflected into them, and then when they move over the dark tape, that light level will drastically decrease. So we should see a much lower uh, light level coming out of them. So that's, that's the basic idea, and we'll talk more about the, the details, the physical way that they work a little later. Okay. Yeah. Other questions? You were muted. Yeah. You were there, looks like. Oh, that's another Arduino, huh? No, I pulled, pulled right over. Yeah. See, I got a hard voltage uh, because sometimes I hook on bigger things. Mm -hmm. like, like put like 120 on these things. Yeah, so there's a lot of add-ons that you can I buy for hard Yeah. 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 About the programming or about the 3D printing that we talked about? Yeah. So what we're doing for, so I gave right, yeah. we're going black, we are doing the set for the blinking. Yeah. And then we are doing the four directions. Yes. And if you are one of the first four people, uh, alphabetically, uh, then you will also come and talk to me and we'll do the, we'll get your name tag started printing. Yes. Um, yeah, is it working uh, with uh, the left, right turns and functions and all that? Uh, would it be okay if we just like mess around with like light blinking? Sure. Yes, absolutely. If you have extra time at the end of the lab and want to play around with the programming, you know, try different things, then by all means, yeah, for a while, right now. Can you pull out a robot that you can test? Hang on, just one second. So, so this website, yes, you're you're writing your program that you're storing in there. Yes. Can you have the one you're working on and pull another one down and open it up so you can cut and paste? Or um. So yes, cutting and pasting doesn't Isn't work there? very well. Um, what you can do is there's there's a way that you can like load up another program into one that's already existing. So you can have a program, pull another program in, and then cut out what you don't want. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, we can talk more about that. Awesome. I've had mixed results with that. Yes. And then you want a snippet of this loaded up onto the canvas as well? Yes. Please. Yeah. Can you uh, save key specific yeah. function? Or a different file, you know what I mean? Um, oh, I see what you mean. Um, you, yeah, you can try and do that. Um, 
I, I would put it all in one. No, I mean, like, you wanted to, like, like you were saying, you set a tag case, and so, like, you have certain function you want to use on multiple projects. Yeah. Maybe, like, it in. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, I think that would be possible. In this case, it's probably not a good idea, but I think yeah. it would be possible. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, other questions? Other questions? Yes. Uh, we're just making the light blink function for this lab, right? Well, the light we were gonna, yeah, we're gonna actually do two tonight: the light blink and then the the four uh, go forward, go backward, turn left, and turn right. So, and then we'll do the 3D printing if you're one of the first four people. Yeah. Other questions? All right. Then let me take ten minutes and then go. Oh, and we're going to the, we're going to go to room 308 today, all right? Yeah, so we're always going somewhere else. 308 today, all right? Yeah. Yeah. If you're, yeah, working with Gary, that's the same room where you do the microphone. All right, so. Oh, 308, that's, uh, that's next door to Randy Schuster's. So. Yeah, yeah, that's right. All right, so. Okay. Is Tom, how many you? Okay, Jonathan Borcher. Here. Jacob Bronson, present, and Michael Chambers. Yes, All right, so you four are gonna work with me and we'll put the, um, we'll get your 3D prints started today. We'll get everybody else's prints started in a little while, okay? So, uh, Errol Cousteau. Here. Dave Bailey, Kyle Doyle, Kyle, Carmen Fasolo, Andy Hernandez, here. Chase Holmes, here. Mill Bufano, here. Melissa Houston, here. Austin Kettle, here. Philip Lozano, here. Benjamin McNeely, here. Jerry Mendez Gonzalez, here. Chu Mua, here. Aaron Brooks, here. Jennifer Ross, here. Harrison Slava, here. Kai Tran, here. Ricky, people put their pictures up here. Phil Wiecek, here. Jason Wilkes, here. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Josh Slavzenko, here. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. Oh yeah, I never uh, thought of it. So yeah, I'm trying to put my pitch in. Yeah. 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 We make a... Yeah.